This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there, HRT, in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And... Because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Oh, hello, my friends. I didn't see you there. It's been a long time. A long time. Yes, it's been over ten episodes since my friends, your friends, Brendan and Jason, have gone about reviewing films from the list produced by the British Film Institute. And now, my friends, it is time to return. So pick up your boots, put on your silly little caps, load your... Lancaster bombers with bombs full of film knowledge and interest. And welcome back to a regular episode of Full Screen and Country. Enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Guinness. I must go now. I don't wish to speak with you any further. Okay. Oh, jetpack. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> they, they have jetpacks now. Man, okay. everybody jetpacks out of here. Man, that's that's really cool. I, I I like that I have that to look forward to when I die. That that <laughs> if I'm as good a person as somebody like Alec Guinness or or Woody Allen, Woody Allen's dead, right? Uh, did you say good a person? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Woody Allen died in 1985, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and and yeah. a great person too. Yeah, because I really like Annie Hall. I really like getting even. Uh huh. Um. <laughs> I don't know if that erases the other things. Do, do I live in a universe where the South won the Civil War? I feel like that might be part of it. What is know. going on? We'll talk about it later. We got a whole Bernstein effect going. Is that what that's called? The Bernstein effect? That's what it's called in your universe, right? You know, the Bernstein effect? Hey, Jason, I'm just going to show you these five quick articles about Woody Allen. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Hmm. You know what? Let's talk about this later. I'm okay. just going to pretend. I'm just going to forget about anything i said already and we're just gonna talk about a british movie we're just gonna rewind <laughs> yeah, yeah. um yeah whose movies i like brendan whose movies? woody allen i love no! woody allen's movies. it's so good <laughs> you know god damn it he's still alive he's dead right did you learn nothing learn nothing about what <laughs> i'm brendan i'm jason and this is another episode of for screen and country and on this episode you know, it's it's weird for me to not say normally because we're back to what we normally do. I know. We after that ten weeks of normal, we thought we could wait out the plague, Brendan, but we didn't. We couldn't. No, we were defeated. <laughs> COVID nineteen D E F period for screen and country. In ten weeks. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but this is, uh, yeah, this is a regular episode. We're back to regular episodes. And what we usually do on this show, and what we are doing this week, see, it's weird for me still, um, is we're taking a movie, every week we take a movie off the BFI Top 100 list uh, of uh, the, you know, British films, the British yes. Film Institute, Top 100 British Films of All Time, as compiled in the year of our Lord, 1999. Anointed um, by God himself. Yeah, uh, Tom Hanks. Yep. Um, so we analyze the movie, we talk about its impact, we we say, you know, is it significant? Does it hold up? Is it good? A lot of times, well, not a lot of times, yeah. but a few times, I think we've kind of come to the conclusion that a few of these are not that great. Well, I mean, episode two, uh, right out of the gate, episode two with uh, uh, English Patient, you and I both were not particularly hot on that, to say the least. And if you're wondering... Damn, that was razor sharp precision on how Jason uh, picked out the episode number. He was just looking at the podcast on his uh, <laughs> on his app. So no, I remember that. I remember that because that was that was our thing. We we watched Doctor Zhivago, which was great but long, and then we watched fucking English Patient. <laughs> we watched three epics. That are, no, no, Zulu was second, I believe. No. Yeah, it was Doctor Zhivago, Zulu, and then English Patient. I think. I am gonna pull up my podcaster app because I don't like to be wrong, Brendan. You know that about me. If there's one thing you know about me, it's that I do not like to be wrong. And so I am gonna go look. Preview episode: Doctor Zhivago 27, Zulu 31. I am wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations, Brendan. You are right. You have won a gift basket of fucks that I don't have. It wouldn't be a thing that Brendan would normally do to you, would it be? Because, <laughs> hello, 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 it's me, Daniel Day-Lewis. Oh, no. No, not you again. Not now. Not, not, we, we thought we'd got rid of you. I fooled you, didn't I? I never expected you to take the form of Brendan. You usually take the form of me. Why would you do that? <laughs> I must I, lie now. You're, ah, you're ah. such a phenomenally talented actor, and it's again stabbed us in the back. Oh. What have you done with Brendan? <sighs> Oh, his crotch. It's so hairy. Oh, God. Oh, God. What ha What's happening? He stood on top. Did you not notice that I was abnormally tall? He was standing on my shoulders the whole time. Well, given we've been doing this podcast via Skype, I, I have a hard time seeing you. Uh, you Damn you and your logic. <laughs> I mean, you you did sound a bit taller, but I thought that you had just been playing, you know, with the with the sweeteners and the tweeters and, and you know, just really, really sweetening that voice up. <laughs> The sweeteners and the tweeters. But what uh, happened to him? He was just there. Now you're talking to me all casually. Where'd he go? He just he just turned into a bat and flew away. But he, for oh. some reason, he made it sound like a hawk. Oh. Uh, I don't know. That's weird. Uh, he's he. It's been a while since he's been here, so he had I guess you know called for it. It's got to happen. <sighs> you really, really going to do something about that? We're going to have to install some defenses, but we'll talk about that in the post podcast meeting. We yes, which we have every every week. Every week. Every week. Um. We do have a movie to talk about this week. Oh, we do. And, and, and yeah, what a movie. Here yeah, we, go. We, we are talking about. So we're going all the way, almost to the very tippy top of the list. We are Almost going all the way to the top. The cream rises to the top. Yeah. Ooh, um, yeah. We are talking about number two on the BFI top 100. And number two is another David Lean film called Brief Encounter. Encounter 1945, very significant year in history. Good movie. Yeah, great movie. We'll see you later. <laughs> oh, and no, we can't. It's called Brief Encounter. We do a five minute episode about it and we move on. Wouldn't Clear. it be hilarious if this was our longest episode yet? It may be. Uh, <laughs> we do have a. Well, you know, we do have a lot to get into for this movie. Uh, even though this movie is a scant 86 minutes long, it is dense. There is and a lot in this it's movie. The, it's the best kind of movie where it's it's really short, but yeah, there's just so much going on uh, uh, and lots to talk about. So we've got in this movie, this is a David Lean film. I believe this is the fourth David Lean film we've talked about. We talked about Dr. Zhivago. We've talked about Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, and... Um, 
uh, great expectations. This is the fifth movie, fifth David yeah. Lean movie, with two more to go. Um, so let's talk about the cast in this movie. We've got Celia Johnson uh, playing the title role of Laura. Uh, Trevor Howard, who actually didn't do a whole lot of film acting uh, back in the day, uh, playing the other title role of Alec Harvey. Uh, Stanley Holloway, who we remember from uh, Passport to Pimlico. And who I remember as Alfred Doolittle in My Fair Lady. Okay. I, I've actually never seen that. Oh, it's great. You should watch Rex Harrison. Fantastic. Maybe I'll save it for that other podcast idea we had off air. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Although I feel like J- Nathan also hasn't seen that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, there's there's lots of uh, must-see musicals. I don't know that My Fair Lady is the must-see musical, but it's certainly for me, it's, it's an important one since I was in it. Well, uh, he plays Albert Godby. Uh, Joyce Carey plays Myrtle Baggett. She's the one who works at the, uh, the little cafe by the train station. I want to say she's sort of a bar maiden, but also she doesn't seem to serve alcohol very much because it always seems to be out of hours. Yeah, she's 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 sassy. Yeah. Um, Cyril Raymond plays Frank, Laura's husband. A little stuffy, but, you know, well-meaning. Yeah. Uh, Everly Gregg plays Dolly, which might be the funniest part of the whole movie. <laughs> uh, Dolly Messenger, kind of a motor mouth. And last but not least, we've got Margaret Barton playing Beryl Waters, the uh, assistant to Myrtle in the cafe. It's a fairly small cast because it's a fairly small scale story but like i said at the top and like jason kind of said as well there is a lot going on here and uh we're gonna get into it we are gonna get into it i want to say right right off the bat in this movie we and we because we have the screen share saw it in the uh when we saw the music there but like the opening of this movie has just such a wonderfully composed shot of a train platform and then a train coming by and it's all at angles and it's, it's just a wonderful wonderfully composed shot to open the movie and i saw that and thought okay i'm in i mean this is obviously david lean he knows how to make a fucking movie oh uh, everything is meticulously planned in this movie and yes. you can feel it right from the right from the opening credits to the closing and and props to the people that did the remaster of this movie because it looks absolutely gorgeous <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah and this is this is definitely the smallest scale david lean movie we've watched so far yeah absolutely i mean and i think like, like Russian Revolution and World War One and 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 uh, World War Two in the jungle, but no, this is just this is about a couple people. Hmm. Well, Jason, break it down into its base level. What is this uh, movie about? This is a movie about a bored housewife getting her rocks off. <laughs> I mean, well, okay, well that, that that would be a way to describe it if it were a bit more salacious, but it's not quite that salacious. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, Celia Johnson plays Laura. Uh, and Laura's a, you know, she's a housewife. She's got a night, she, you know, she's got a, a, an upstanding husband. And, you know, he's got a little mustache and likes to play the, cro- you know, do the crossword. Play the crossword? No, I think you do the crossword. Unless you had an electronic crossword, but I don't think they had those in 1945. They were limited at the time. They were very limited. I think only the military had them for specific applications. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he seems like an all right guy. But uh, so she's just, you know, she's living the life of a 40s housewife. She takes care of the kids, but every week she uh, gets to go to town on the train to go pick up the groceries and do some errands and take in a film and have lunch at her favorite little restaurant and then go home. And it's her one little glimpse of freedom once a week. Mm -hmm. And on one of those trips, she has a chance encounter, a brief encounter, if you will. Uh, I will. With a young doctor named Alec. Well, not maybe not that young. He looks pretty old, actually, but but maybe by like 1945 standards, he was quite young. I, I uh, think I think they're both actually he believe it or not. I was kind of blown away by this. He is actually about six years younger than her, which okay. number I guess, one, I thought he was older. And number two, the guys younger, the guys younger than the woman. That is a that is a first. Yeah, no, but I guess they are. They are the see my confusion there was initially I thought that Dolly was like uh, Laura's mother. <laughs> okay. she had that energy of like oh her mother shows up and then just kind of takes over the conversation and starts yakking so once i figured out that no no she's actually probably more likely similar in age to her and they clearly this younger celia johnson must have been a younger actress at the time that was made up a little bit to look older i feel like she has to be i think she was in her like i want to say almost late 30s and uh trevor howard who plays uh, alec was in his early 30s so it's not a huge gap but it's um, interesting that he looks much older than she does. He certainly looks older than his early 30s. I'll say that. Well, you but, know, uh, British people and smoking. Yeah, exactly. So and, and smoking everywhere, as mm. we see in this movie. Um, yes. 
So she's in the the cafe that is a place that we return to numerous times over the movie. It's the cafe on the platform. And it's kind of like Rex. She goes outside to watch the express train go by. And in doing so, of course, it blows a bunch of dust as it goes by and she gets some grit in her eye. And so she's in the cafe trying to deal with that. And then this man, Alec, walks up. And he's like, oh, let me take a look. I'm a doctor, you see. And so he like pulls out a handkerchief and uh, uh, gets the grit out. And, and they uh, she thanks him and they go about their day. And that is where it should have ended, Brendan. <laughs> if she was any sort of a decent lady with a decent uh, 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 outlook on life. But no, it did not end there. No, it does not. It's kind of, and it kind of snowballs in a really realistic way. Yeah, I guess that's that's the that's the big thing that sticks out here. Yeah, because this this is what this literally is. There's no like foreshadowing. There's no like setting up of some dramatic payoff. They literally just happen to encounter each other briefly and then move on with their day. But then the next week, she runs into him coming out of, or or was it at? No, not doesn't run into him coming out. She's at. They're lunch. just like walking by each other. Well, they it, they walk by each other at first. Yes, and then she sits down for lunch, and he comes in looking for a table, and it's very busy, and and she offers a seat to him, and of course, then they sit down and start uh, conversa- conversating. Yeah, uh, conversating. That's the, that's the word, conversating. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this this go- uh, continues. They go to the movies. They uh, uh, they hang out with each other, and at some point, they realize that there's a little more going on here than just friendly friendship. And it, but surprisingly, it's only four weeks in, I think, when we when <laughs> they've seen each other. They've met each other like four separate times mm-hmm. and and he drops the L bomb on her and and she's, you know, distraught. But well, she's into it, too. And and I think that might be the first clip we kind of look at here, because this is a, this is the moment they kind of realize or he, you know, he tells her like he loves her and she realizes it, too. It's nothing like I expected. Like the scene is handled so differently than you would normally expect in like a cliche. Oh, someone's having a torrid affair yeah. and it's handled almost like it's like, it's an inconvenience, which it definitely is. Like, you know it what is. I mean? These yeah, well, two because... people are not going about their day trying to cheat on their spouses. We no. should, we should know. He also has a wife. Yes. He has a wife. I think he has some kids too. Yeah. Uh, he has, he's, he's, he's a successful children. doctor. He's, you know, he's, he's very successful. He's got an important uh, position. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so play the scene. Yeah, let's take let's take a listen here. You know what's happened, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. I've fallen in love with you. Yes, I know. Tell me honestly, please tell me honestly if what I believe is true. What do you believe? That it's the same with you. That you've fallen in love too. Sounds so silly. Why? I know you're so little. It is true though, isn't it? Yes, it's true. Laura. No, please. We must be sensible. Please help me to be sensible. We mustn't behave like this. We must forget that we've said what we've said. Not yet. Not quite yet. But we must, don't you see? Listen. It's too late now to be as sensible as all that. It's too late to forget what we said. And anyway, whether we'd said it or not couldn't have mattered. We know. We've both of us known for a long time. How can you say that? I've only known you for four weeks. We only talked for the first time last Thursday week. Last Thursday week. Has it been a long time for you since then? Answer me truly. Yes. How often did you decide that you were never going to see me again? Several times a day. So did I. (laughs) I love you. I love your wide eyes. The way you smile. And your shyness. And the way you laugh at my jokes. Please don't. I love you. I love you. You love me too. It's no use pretending it hasn't happened, because it has. Yes, it has. I don't want to pretend anything either to you or to anyone else. But from now on, I shall have to. That's what's wrong, don't you see? That's what spoils everything. That's why we must stop here and now talking like this. When either of us free to love each other, there's too much in the way. There's still time. If we control ourselves, behave like sensible human beings, there's still time. Yeah, I just think that's really interesting, the way they handle that. It's like, you know, we they kind of both realize, like, 
yo, we're we're in love with each other. Like it, he even like he even asks us in that scene, like how many times did you go over in your head that you weren't gonna see me again? Yeah, he knew. Like, he knew did you wrestle with sense. yourself about that? Because I did. Yeah. And you know, how much did you think about this day and, and stuff like that? And, and, you know, they're trying to say like, well, wh- what stage can we end it before it gets like past the point of no return? So it's a very, like, it's, it's, I mean, it's almost a very British way of also dealing oh, with it, but yes, it's, absolutely. This, this, but it's also, this whole movie, this whole movie is, is, is uh, pen, uh, like permeated with uh, a crippling politeness that, that comes with being British. Uh, and, and that we as Canadians also, also have a, a, a bit of in us <laughs> as well. It's also just hand. It just feels real. It does. It does. And it's it's a contrast to American movies, to like, obviously, the modern version of this movie would be something like Chasing Amy. Uh, and in that movie, when when uh, Ben Affleck is converting a lesbian back to the back to the home team, he, uh, he they have like a big blowout, like a screaming blowout thing that then culminates with a kiss in the rain, you know, like classic fucking American romance stuff. Uh, whereas this is so much quieter. It's so restrained. It's so. It, it's raw and real in that way, but it's not, you know, it's it's not two people getting that raw and real out through screaming. It's through just like trying to, <laughs> trying to deal with this and maintain a little bit of composure. It's, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, uh, w- little touches that I like in this movie um, that kind of add to that is you have the first time. Okay. So the first time they meet up, um, they go on sort of a date because they meet up yeah. unintentionally and have food. Uh, he asks if he can go to the pictures with her and she's like, Oh, of course, of course. Well, it's fine. It's n- totally innocent. But then when she returns home, her son has like hurt himself Yes. and she feels guilty. Yeah. Even though she returned, I think at the normal time that she would have returned. Right. So, so regardless of what she had done that day, she wouldn't have been back till that point. She still comes home, knows that he's been hurt and blames herself. And, and of course, yeah, obviously the, idea that she was enjoying herself in a situation that she probably shouldn't have been would would weigh heavily on her despite the fact that it had nothing to do with this yeah like while this had happened yeah um clearly not something yeah exactly not something she had under her control and at least the scene that i really like um where she kind of tests the waters where she's like you know what i'm just gonna tell my husband what happened today yep just gonna tell him that i hung up with the dude to the movies and gauge his reaction and this felt very like genuine to me too. Let's just listen to this uh, this scene here. I had lunch with a strange man today, and he took me to the movies. Good for you. He's awfully nice. He's a doctor. A very noble profession. Oh dear. It was Richard the Third who said, "My kingdom for a horse," wasn't it? Yes, darling. Yes. Well, I wish to goodness he hadn't, because it spoils everything. I thought perhaps we might ask him to dinner one night. By all means. Who? Dr. Harvey, the one I was telling you about. Must it be dinner? Well, you're never at home for lunch. Exactly. Oh, Fred. (laughs) Now, what on earth's the matter? (laughs) It's nothing. It's only... Oh, Fred. I really don't see what's so frightfully funny. (laughs) Oh, I do. It's all right, darling. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at me. (laughs) I'm the one that's funny. I'm an absolute idiot. (laughs) Worrying myself about things that don't exist and making mountains out of (laughs) molehills. I told you when you came in that it was nothing serious. There was nothing to get into such a state about. I I do see that. I really do. (laughs) It's a bit of a crazy laugh. It it is. um, But what I really like is that when she says that to him and he has the most non-reaction to everything, yeah. she's like, oh, I am silly. Like, I'm making more out of this than it was. And the funny thing is, I love the misinterpretation because he thinks that she's laughing off the fact that she was so – okay, like, there's a bunch of things going on here. Like, when she comes in and the kid is hurt, um, she has, a cr- she has a, like, a genuine, like, sad reaction to it. Like, yeah. oh, my God. And guilt. And he thinks it's just guilt because she feels bad that he got hurt. Yeah. Um, so he even says in that scene, like, see, he's perfectly fine. It was just a little bit of a bump. And she and she says, of course, like, oh, yes, I know that now. But she's talking about something completely different. I also I, I enjoy in this scene his characterization because he comes across it's a combination of two things. I think he, on one hand, he is a decent guy mm-hmm. and he's a trusting husband. And, and the idea that that his wife was hanging out with a guy 
does not necessarily in his head say to her, say to him that she's having an affair. So right. he clearly does trust his wife, but also he's that type that he's doing the crossword puzzle. He's only kind of half listening to her. <laughs> yeah. So part of that may just be like, he's just not really paying attention just because she says, I met a strange man and had lunch with him. And he's like, Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I mean, there is a part later where she's clearly doing like make her makeup and stuff um, more than she usually does just in the home. And he says like, all right, let me know when you're done with the beautifying. I want my dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but he's, he's kind of like, he's kind of like a, a, a bore, but yeah. he's not, he's not an asshole. Like he's not a no. monster. Like no, you could we... <laughs> easily, easily, easily make this guy a total villain. Yeah. This, this could have ventured into kitchen sink drama if he had been just a shithead. If he'd just been like an abusive piece of shit and she was trying to find solace in another relationship. But that's not what this movie's about. That's not what this movie's trying to say. This guy is a decent guy. He's not a bad guy. And, and, and the fact that he trusts her is part of what gives her so much grief and, and guilt. And is yeah, that, she, that she knows she's violating that trust that he has completely in her. She even says that line about, uh, about you know, him trusting her. Oh yeah, where the the where she says it's easy to lie when you know that you're trusted implicitly. So very yeah. easy and so very easy and so degrading. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because you were yeah exactly. It's like it's it's one thing to lie to someone who doesn't trust you because you're you're trying to get one over on them, but to somebody who does trust you, yeah, it is easy because you don't have to work at it. You just do it because they don't think you're gonna lie. What a piece of shit you are. <laughs> <laughs> the other interesting thing, the other um thing about the realism, and I know I'm talking a lot about the realistic nature of this movie, but that's a big part of it. Is um. I love the way she at first she finds it kind of awkward to like tell him like what happened. Well, she does tell him what happened. She realizes it's silly. And yeah. then she tells like her first real lie, like about um, how she met up with someone in town. And then she calls that girl to create yeah. like an alibi. And that was my immediate thought when I'm watching that scene. Yeah. I'm watching. She, she mentions this person's specific name. And I thought, oh, that's going to be the thing that fucks her over. He's going to run into her. And then immediately the next scene, she calls this woman and gets her to cover for her. And she has to then lie again to come up with a cover story for why she needs her to cover for her. <laughs> right. And she, it just it just d- dives deeper and deeper. And you really yeah. start to – you really feel for her in this movie. That's the thing. Yeah. I think the reason – now, because there's a, there's a thing here I was thinking about while I was watching this movie. And I'm like, why do they never show – the guy, the guy's wife, like they show her, her husband and her children, but you never see the other side of that. And I think that's because she is the central, like emotional center yeah. of this movie. Yeah, She's who we follow in this movie. So we only really see her perspective. We don't see outside that. Like, are there any scenes? Are there, well, there are a couple scenes of this movie without her, but it's usually with the people in the uh, cafe. <laughs> oh, can we talk about the people in the cafe? Cause they were yeah. wonderful. Yeah, so we got Stanley Holloway, who's like a, I think he's a conductor or like one of the guy on the platform that wrangles people onto trains. I don't know. I don't think he actually rides the trains because he's in that cafe a lot. I think he's uh, just the whistleblower. <laughs> yeah, and then we got the lady behind the bar who uh, is serving everything and kind of you know she's she's this classic British archetype of you know the the kind of gossipy uh, but but also strong matronly woman that runs the runs the joint and doesn't take shit from people. Mm-hmm. Even though later a bunch of a couple soldiers come in and insult her, and she has to call Stanley Holloway in to take care of it, and he just tells him to up off, <laughs> or up on, up on. She she puts them she puts them in their place pretty good, but she needs that uh, that brute uh, physicality of Stanley Holloway to get them out of there. And she was really but, hurt. They insulted her, and she was ready. She was on the verge of tears. <laughs> she um they they have an interesting little relationship too because at the beginning of the movie the beginning of the movie starts out at the end essentially. Yes. Because we see kind of this and, – and, and what I really like about it is you get everything without any dialogue. Because yeah. you see her, you see um, Laura and uh, Alec, the you know, the two people having the affair with each other, yeah. just sitting at a table in the cafe and they're kind of silent. You can see that they're, they're talking, but we're not listening to that. We're just hearing like – uh, the matronly uh, owner of the cafe speaking with Stanley Holloway, uh, yeah. uh, Godby, and uh, – you know, she's getting a little annoyed at him because he mentioned something about someone getting married and then suddenly she grows very cold and walks away and you're like, oh, what's that whole thing about? And then when we're and then when you when you get the, you get the introduction of this Dolly character who just is a motor mouth nice. to the extreme, one of those old ladies, like you said, um, who just likes to talk. Yes. Just, <laughs> just, just does not shut up. Just needs to tell you about everything right now. What I and, love about. 
what, what I really love about when she's introduced, because this, as, as, as you said, this is the end of the movie, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, at the beginning, and then we come back yeah. around to it. So we don't know what's going on. So Dolly sits down, and she's going and yakking and yakking and yakking. And, and not knowing how the movie plays out, I see the look on uh, Laura's face, and it is this just look of just despair and sadness and and just like uh, uh, like anticipating dread, you know. And I interpreted at that point as like she is really, really not looking forward to the train ride home with this dolly. Oh man, <laughs> she so does not want to listen to this dolly fucking talk, which ends up being true, but that's not the whole reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, and then you see um, the two of them kind of like you know her and Alec kind of exchange a few a few little glances like a few little eye movements and stuff, and you're like, oh, okay, something, something. else is going on here. Yeah, and also um, I, I again props to Dolly's performance uh, when she walks in and plops down and she says to Alec, oh, could you get me a tea? I don't think I could move a further step, and so he goes over. <laughs> Brings the tea back, and she he, she goes, oh, there's a lot of milk in it, though, but it'll be refreshing, very passive-aggressively. And she goes, I usually take it with sugar, as if he would know. And he's just like, it's on the spoon. And she's like, oh, hey. <laughs> did you notice the little Did you notice the little callback to that, by the uh, way, the sugar oh, on the spoon? No, what was that? So so later on, when, um, I mean, a little bit later on, when he first arrives into the cafe, I think we basically discover here that this is his first time in this cafe. Because when he gets his, his tea... Um, he actually asks her, uh, the matron, um, sugar, and she says it's in the spoon. He goes, oh, but at the beginning of the movie that takes place at the end of the movie, he already knows that. Huh. So it's like, it's a little, it's a little thing. I don't know. It was interesting. It's like, oh, okay. So at the, at the later on when we first meet him, that's clearly yeah. his first time there. Oh, that's a great little detail. That's awesome. And, and then did, did it would come back around like that, that did David Lean would have the foresight to set that up just as a little thing, just such a little minor thing to kind of yeah. like establish the chronology of it. I, I am proud to say I found that myself. I didn't have to look it up. Woo! Yay! <laughs> so, she, uh, so she has a bit of a fit there uh, after everything goes down uh, that at that point we are unaware of. And, of course, what's the solution? They <laughs> insist on giving her a glass of brandy, even though it's outside hours. So. Yeah, and because and another thing too is because we don't know the whole story, we we see um, as soon as uh, Dolly turns her back to go get Brandy, um, Laura heads out. We hear we hear a train go by, mm. and then she comes back in just looking like a deer in headlights and saying that she feels faint. To which we later learn on she was contemplating jumping in front of that train. Yeah, I and I think part of it was uh, just the the timing of it seemed to be she walked out just as the train was coming by and she wouldn't I don't think she even would have had time to jump in front of the train uh, if she'd even wanted to. Yeah, but there was a, there was a brief moment and and again it's not like a thing where it's like oh I almost jumped in front of the train that day I contemplated ending everything no it's not spelled out like that this is not that kind of movie. Yeah, exactly. There is some voiceover and I actually the voiceover I think is done really well. Yeah, um, which is a rarity for a lot of movies. But let's let's play a little bit of the voiceover when she is kind of getting bamboozled by by uh, uh, Dolly. Yeah. Good luck. This train's generally packed. I really am very worried about you, dear. You look terribly peaky. I'm all right, really. I am. I just felt faint for a minute. That's all. It often happens to me. I did it once in the middle of Bobby's school concert. I don't think he's ever forgiven me. <laughs> Well, he certainly was very good looking. Who? Well, your friend, Dr. whatever his name was. Yes, he's a nice creature. Have you known him long? No, not very long. I hardly know him at all, really. <laughs> well, my dear, I've always had a passion for doctors. I can well understand how it is that women get neurotic. Of course, some of them go to... I wish I could trust you. I wish you were a wise, kind friend. Instead of a gossiping acquaintance I've known casually for years and never particularly cared for. I wish. I wish. Fancy him going all the way to Africa. Is he married? Oh, yes. Any children? Yes, two boys. He's very proud of them. Is he taking them with him, his wife and children, I mean? Yes, yes, he is. Oh, I suppose it's sensible in a way, rushing off to start life anew in the wide open spaces and all that sort of thing, but <laughs> wild horses wouldn't drag me away from England and home and all the things I'm used to. I mean... One has one's roots, after all, hasn't one? 
Oh, yes, one has one's roots. I knew a girl years ago who went to Africa, you know. Her husband was something to do with engineering or something. And, my dear, she had the most dreadful time. She got some awful kind of germ through going out on a picnic and she was ill for months and months. I wish you'd stop talking. I wish you'd stop prying and trying to find things out. I wish you were dead. No, I don't mean that. That was silly and unkind. But I wish you'd stop talking. It's so yeah. real. It's so yeah. real. Like her, her going like, I wish you were dead. And then immediately following up with, no, that's not, that's not what I actually think. Don't, I don't want you dead, but I just wish you'd stop talking like that. That rings so true. <laughs> right. It's like you're hearing a, per, it's like you're actually hearing thoughts. Like so many yeah. voiceovers when you're hearing someone, you know, someone's thoughts, uh, it's, it's so unrealistic. It's like, nobody thinks in their head like that. Like that's just, that's just not how it works. But this movie just captures that. Yeah. And this it's, is 1945. This is not yeah. a, this is not a thing that like, was super well established at that point no and and i think this is one of these movies that would be like I, i've talked about before like an or movie kind of like casablanca where so many modern tropes that have been you know the beaten to the point of uh, uh you know d- dead horses that have been beaten to the point of of nothing left uh come from and and a lot of times you see old movies with those tropes in them and you think they feel like dated or or whatever because uh, they were the originator of those tropes that were then completely, you know, uh, just beaten to death. Uh, but but this movie, despite having so many roots of those tropes, everything about it feels like legit and, and yeah. everything feels right. It doesn't feel like it's a parody of itself like some old movies do. Well, um, it's funny you should mention that to the parody uh, thing, too, because I think David Lean mocks those movies in one particular scene. Yeah. The, where they go to the movie theater and see that trailer for Flames of Passion. Yeah, and so I went and I, I thought, okay, I got to look up and see if that's a real movie. And while there is a British movie that does occasionally go by the title Flames of Passion, that's a silent movie from 1922. Uh, Flames yeah. of Passion is not a real movie, but what Flames of Passion is, and I'm not going to pretend that I came up with this myself because I, I was reading a website that then pointed this out, is that Flames of Passion is basically uh, like a counterpoint to this movie. Yeah, in that, in you you're saying it's a parody, but like it's 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 this open like like it's epic. It's got all these people in it. It's just over the top and energetic, and it's about these two people trying to get together and 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 their flames of passion burning. And that's totally the opposite of what this movie is, which is two people trying to keep their urges under control so they don't cause something inconvenient to happen. <laughs> yeah, it feels like um, it's like that. It feels kind of like uh, from here to eternity, as opposed to this movie. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I've never seen that movie, but that's the sort of like grandiose, like romantic yeah. melodrama. Yeah. The, um, the... Yeah. Which David Lean is kind of mocking in a way. I mean, they even have this little bit here. Although I, I, I'm pretty sure for here, from here to eternity came out like six or seven years after this movie. But yes, well, I mean, I mean, the, in that style, yes, you know, a Hollywood yeah. romance movie. Yeah. Um, they even have this little bit here where they mock it as it starts. And I did include the bit before this just because uh, I really enjoy how they describe Donald Donald Duck. <laughs> the stars can change in their courses, the universe go up in flames and the world crash around us, but they'll always be Donald Duck. Oh, I do love him so, his dreadful energy and his blind, frustrated rage. It's a big picture now. Here we go. No more laughter, prepare for tears. Like, just the mocking, prepare for tears. <laughs> yeah, okay, so speaking of mocking, just let me say this for one sec. I got to get this out of the way because our heroes kind of disappointed me in, in this movie. So when, they, when they're having lunch initially, uh, there's a band playing on stage which consists of three middle-aged ladies, one on piano, one on cello, and, and one on, I think, double bass. And I think yeah. one of them is actually Dolly. Uh, uh, no, I don't no? think so. No, I, I thought the one so. on double bass was Dolly because it looked like her, but it doesn't matter. So... Uh, they're they're playing and and they just sit there just making fun of them the whole time just just totally making fun of them and their abilities as musicians and now I think they sounded pretty good uh, they certainly sound better than I could play a fucking double bass or a cello but then especially shit on the cello uh, uh, player which then of course comes back around later when they go to a show and she's the organ player I mean that uh, is a great joke yeah it was a fun joke <laughs> uh, so Jason I don't know if you know this but the cellist is someone we've actually seen in, in a couple movies on this uh, podcast before oh who was it well she is one of the teachers in the bells of Saint Trinians oh and she was mrs kite in I'm all right Jack oh all right okay yeah mrs awesome. Irene Handel. That was uh that was uh Peter Sellers' wife. Mm-hmm. Yes, awesome. Great. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. 
Oh, well, lots of old friends in this movie. Lots of old friends. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that is... <laughs> it does seem a little cruel. Although it is yeah. interesting later that when she's there by herself, she says... I didn't I didn't even think it was like funny to laugh at the cello player. I, I more just felt sad for her. Oh, and that's even worse. <laughs> she was playing. Cello. She was doing something she loved. Just let her fucking enjoy herself. Come on. <laughs> Jesus. These fucking, fucking cello judge. Cello. These judgy British people. British people. You're on notice for being so judgy. David Lean probably had a cello player that worked for him. And he said, listen, this music yeah. is shit. Go to this <laughs> cottage. Make love to your wife. For three days and then come back and write me new music <laughs> man i wish my boss would tell me to do that <laughs> right yeah that's how you get it done that's how fucking dr Shivago happened i know man i'm gonna have to give david, ashton some pointers <laughs> david, that's why david lean was such a controversial brit because he he said sex was the answer and the brits were not having that in the oh, 50s certainly not no jesus i, I they still won't have it <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of when this movie was uh filmed jason this was this came out in 1945. So, uh, so do we know what day? Uh, I don't know what day it came out, but I do know that they filmed this during, I mean, the war was still going on. Yeah. It was winding down, but it was still going on. And actually, um, what's interesting here is that they they had to, uh, they actually had to um, move locations at one point. They were going to film this in uh, a certain place in England. Uh, but they had to they had to move to a different train station because there were basically threats of rocket attacks from the Germans. Yeah. Well, those V2s, you know, they had good ranges and they could just hit whatever was in the way. So you wouldn't want to risk that. They also had to uh, break from filming on Victory of Europe Day, not because everyone was going to go, but because they basically said, we're taking all your cameras for this. Yeah, we kind of need them. <laughs> so the day the day the Germans unconditionally surrendered in World War II, they had to take a break from uh, from filming for a little bit. If there's any day, I, look, if there's any day I would want off, it would be like, oh, the Germans surrendered. I'm getting shittered. I'm getting completely drunk and celebrating. Obviously, why would you yeah. keep working? That's ridiculous. What What do you think about like? I mean, I'm pretty sure, and I guess if you look it up, there is a clue because in the Flames of Passion movie that they watch, you could see the copyright date is like 1938. Mm -hmm. So it's isn't it interesting that they make this movie take place before the war? Yeah. It kind of gives it a kind of a sense of foreboding in a way. Yeah, is it over the whole thing. But it all, and I imagine a sense of nostalgia too. Like you think 1945, like selling a movie about a pre-war thing is going to appeal to uh, a, a war-ravaged population for sure. Yeah, you know, just you, as an escapist form of entertainment. <laughs> well, and that's my question. Do you think they do it to kind of take that out of the equation so people aren't even factoring the war into the into the plot? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's a. In, I don't know that they're intentionally avoiding the war, like in the in the plot of the movie, because I think the play probably takes place before the uh, war as well. But it is definitely a movie that you know is not made to comment on current events. It's very much its own thing, and 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 I we can see why that would be a movie made because that would be, like I say, the sort of thing that especially well, this movie was released uh, in November, okay. so. This was after after the war was completely over, after the Japanese mm -hmm. surrendered. So by this point, people are starting to get back to a, a little bit of normalcy in their life. Although, as we know, rationing and whatnot didn't end until the 50s in Britain. Right. Um, the whole movie yeah. about that. But yeah, exactly. This would have been the sort of movie that I think, yeah, you just got through the war. You're fucking tired. You know, the finally the Germans have finally laid off. You go to the theater, sit down and know you're not going to be bombed to shit. And you can watch this movie about just this small story about a lady and a guy. And just take your mind off everything that's going on around you. It, it's funny, too, that you mentioned the play because this was a play written by Noel Coward. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we will talk about Noel Coward a little more in future movies because there's one he actually co-directed with David Lean coming up uh, on this list at some point. But he was a – yeah, so he was a playwright. And this was his – basically his second – chronologically his second of two collaborations with David Lean. Um, he, was, uh, he was a closeted homosexual his entire life. Which, if you click on his Wikipedia article and you see his picture, you'll just go, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a real nice purple tie. He's very stylish. It, uh, it is, I, I don't it mean is, to cast aspersions, but we know it, what's it's, up. It, yeah, it's the stereotype. Yeah. Um, 
He's uh he he actually what I thought what I thought was interesting in 1924 he wrote a play about a nymphomaniac and her cocaine addicted son, um, of which many people thought the uh, the addic- the drug addiction was a metaphor for his own sexuality because he never actually publicly came out. It was not a thing that you could do at that time. No, God, no. You could be in, in those days. I think you could still be charged criminally. Uh, he being a homosexual. He was also almost killed during the war. Um, he was in the black box theater. And if the Germans had been able to invade Britain at that time, they had they basically had a plan to capture and kill Noel Coward specifically. Well, they had, um, a, they had a list of, of lots yeah. of important cultural and, and political people, and he was one of the many people that was on this list that would have been, yeah, had Operation Sea Lion actually come to fruition and the Germans had invaded and occupied England. He had a bit of a feud with uh, Winston Churchill. <laughs> well, who did it? Churchill basically uh, came up with some kind of backhanded ways to keep him out of the war effort. And I think, I mean, let's just be honest. He was probably a little bit homophobic. (laughs) Churchill? No, certainly not. Oh, Um, I think he said basically he basically came down to he said he preferred coward to entertain people rather than participate in any kind of intelligence work. So Cow- Noel Coward was pretty, pretty hurt by that. But he did go on to uh, kind of achieve some level of fame. I mean, I think he definitely achieved more fame for just his persona. Um, he was very sleek, very chic, very dapper. And, and I, feel, I feel, and I may be wrong, but in British people that are listening, please enlighten me. Uh, I feel like he's still a pop culture reference to this day. I feel like if I watch like a British panel show or something, at some point I can expect uh, the occasional Noel Coward reference. I think we even got one in uh, Happy Go Lucky. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> one of the books she picks up is written by is is about Noel Coward, and yes, I think even right. like in the uh, the movie that came out, God, two years ago, uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me? One of the letters that Melissa McCarthy is forging is from Noel Coward. <laughs> so, wow. He's still out there. He's still in the he's still in the populace. Um, he did achieve some uh, another level of fame later on too. Um, when we get to this movie, because he had a pretty big supporting role in the Italian job. Oh wow! So that kind of propelled him as well. And he my favorite Herzog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm talk, of course I'm talking about the Mark Wahlberg one. Of course, yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just hauled his corpse out for the filming. <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's them over there. Um, <laughs> uh, so one of my favorite things about Noel Carr, though, this is like a quote that he had in an interview because he was known as an egotist. Like I'm not saying he was like a a, a monster of a person, but he had a fair bit of an ego. And he was a character, I imagine. Yeah, they 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 basically on his 70th birthday. Uh, I think he died when he was about 74 years old or something. But they uh, they had a lot of people interviewing him because it was a big deal, 70th birthday. And the Time magazine reporter basically said, you know, I hope you haven't been bored through all these interviews, having to answer the same questions about yourself on your birthday. And his answer was, not at all. I'm fascinated by the subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was I gonna say that. some some like that. It's like, oh no, this is my birthday present. <laughs> yeah, I got to talk about myself. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you gotta love you gotta love the egotist that has the self awareness to know they're an egotist kind of thing. Like, yeah, you, you gotta respect that. <laughs> well, and I mean, he's obviously a great observer of of human characteristics because he comes up with this play, which is turned into this movie. Yes. And absolutely. he 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 gets a, a credit. He gets the final credit, by the way. The director's credit usually comes last. It is rare for the producer to get the final credit before the movie starts. What a tribute to him. That is like a Lawrence Bender situation here. <laughs> I'm, surpri- I'm surprised David Lean got along so well with a homosexual. Well, uh, yeah. But then again, he worked in Hollywood. Well, not Hollywood, but he worked in film, so I suppose it was to be expected. I don't think Lee. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think Lee really cared about that stuff. I think he just wanted people to be good in his movies, and if they didn't, he just hated them. Yeah, that's true. He did. He, did, he, just, he was just. He was just curmudgeon. And let's keep in mind they've all, they only made two movies together. No yeah. one stuck with David Lean for that long, except for like <laughs> Alec Guinness. Yeah. And wow. even Alec Guinness didn't like him, so. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a, a fantastic drinking companion. I'm sorry, I have to leave again. <laughs> oh, wow. Jetpack again. <laughs> Always jetpacking. That's how um, it gets for you. Jason, I do. I want to play something here for you because we're talking about, you know, these movies. What do they inspire? Like, you know, what is their impact on the world? And I think clearly there are movies that are influenced by this. Of course, movies about like torrid love affairs. And I think they kind of missed the point with this for the most part. But one other thing that I noticed is the score of this movie. Maybe you'll recognize – I'm going to play a clip, and 
you're going to hear a little bit of the score and then you're going to hear a little bit of the score repurposed in a song that I think everyone knows. think of that (laughs) wild right i totally now i did not think of this song but watching this scene so this plays when and and interestingly that that score plays when laura is uh walking alone um sitting on a bench that score plays as the police officer you know is like walking by he's like yeah okay love it's pretty cold out here yeah and she walks off on her own and then you know it's a real obviously it's a real piece of music that they took for the score yeah but then Eric Carmen comes along and makes into a song called I Will All By Myself. You, you can't tell me he didn't watch this movie. He must have. There's no there's a, it seems there's, it seems a little too close. There's, <laughs> there's no way. And I, I I actually like weirdly enough, watching it again the second like I watched it twice and watched it in the second time, as I was listening to the music, I was like, What why do I recognize this tune? <laughs> and it kind of like adding lyrics to it. I was like, holy shit. And just to confirm my suspicions. Yep. There you go. Damn. I thought that was interesting. So there's your influence folks. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. So actually we, we should talk about the scene where Alec, it, it eventually gets to the point where Alec is going to uh, bring Laura to his friend's apartment. Mm, yes. Yeah, so flat. Steve, Steve, what Steve Lynn, Steve, Steven. Something like that. He kept saying his name, Steve something. I think it was just Steven. He's on there. He's got to click Steven on Steven Lynn. Yeah, Steve Lynn. His name is Steve Lynn. Va- Valentine Day De- <laughs> Yeah, Valentine Day But yeah, no. So this this whole sequence inspired uh, the apartment. Have you ever seen that movie? I'm familiar with it. Didn't that win an Academy Award Best Picture? It, it won. It won some Oscars. I don't remember if it won Best Picture, but it is about. Uh, yeah, it's basically about Jack Lemmon um, using it, let, letting his uh, his superiors use his apartment as a fuck pad. Hmm. And this whole thing with Alec uh, trying to convince Laura to go to this apartment owned by, I guess, his is it his brother or his friend? No, it, it's his colleague because he fills in one day a week at the hospital for this guy. Yes, right, uh, right, so right. right. Day off and this dude lets him use his apartment to. to uh, well, I don't think because the way he reacts at the end, it's not that's it doesn't seem to me like that was the specific use that he had given him for. No, 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 no. He's more like he's like, hey, I know what goes on, but also like, come on, man. <laughs> but also like, I think this guy, Steve, um, just assumes that um uh, Alec uses it for that all the time, which we clearly know is not the case. He doesn't yes. present to us as this lecherous, like slime bag. Like he's, no, that's, that's kind of how Steve comes off to be fair. He gets, a, he's got, he's got a bit of a slimy uh, edge to him. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's very, he's very like condescending and yeah. you know, he, he's very presumptive of, uh, of what's going on. Um, but he, ba- yeah, he basically says like, Oh, I know what you're doing and you know, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Yeah, like like the very fatherly kind of approach to it, condescending. <laughs> but it's interesting when they come to that scene because they finally have this moment to kind of, um, you know, I guess, it, for, for lack of a better word, consummate the affair. Like, you know, finally uh, get down. Like, they're going to have sex. And, of course, it's 1945, so you know it's not going to happen. Or it's gonna Get be, down, girl. Come on, get down. Or it's going to be very lightly hinted at. But... Yes. Um, it's interrupted, obviously, when Steve arrives home early and she kind of bolts out the back and she's very distraught that she was that close to getting to that level. Yes. Um, and it's and it's just it's heartbreaking. Um, and then, of course, shortly after that, they kind of decide, like, we have to end this. We have to end this. And that's when he brings up the fact that he's going to Africa. He took a job offer in Africa in Johannesburg. Convenient. And, yeah. And um 
And then the most crushing thing in this whole movie is that they're about to have their final meeting before he leaves. Yes. And because, of course, we go back to the beginning of the movie where Dolly interrupted, they don't get their final moment. Nope. They it's just, just they have to just abandon things because Dolly just inserts herself into the middle of it unknowingly, of course. Unknowingly, it's not her fault. She's not a she's not uh, intentionally awful. No, she but... she just is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, which is okay. So funny enough, and the reason I mentioned that apartment scene is so Trevor Howard, who plays Alec, um, basically he had a hard time. Notably, he had a hard time adjusting to acting for the screen because he was a, he was a kind of a stage actor. Yeah. And the most the biggest issue he had was a scene which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's the scene where he's just reading off the the diseases. Yes. Because he's talking about his medical career, but also he didn't understand in the apartment scene why he wouldn't just grab Laura and just make passionate love to her immediately. And David Lean had to take him aside and kind of explain like, you know, this sudden opportunity that you both have to suddenly like consummate your, your lovemaking just, just makes you both like extremely shy all of a sudden yeah. because like it's right there in front of you and you know, it's right there. And then you're like, Holy shit. That's just, this just got real. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and how are uh, Trevor Howard's response to that was, well, you are a funny chap. <laughs> he didn't get it he just didn't get it I, I, I guess that's just in in that situation trevor howard would just go for it i guess i guess we know it's, trevor howard is a go-getter yeah uh, by the way funnily enough when i when i looked up this movie and then i looked up trevor howard the the picture they came up was a picture of him dressed as like a coal miner <laughs> like with a dirty face and a beard and it, it just it was very strange <laughs> yeah. um that, wow that's interesting <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, and, and you know what, we should listen to the scene where they kind of, she kind of falls for him. Like we, we totally hear like it, like we hear, like it's audible that she falls yeah. in love with him here. Um, let's, let's listen to it. It's when he's kind of talking about what he does. I'm terribly ambitious, really. Not ambitious for myself so much as for my special pigeon. What is your special pigeon? Preventive medicine. I see. I'm afraid you don't. <laughs> I was trying to be intelligent. <laughs> Most good doctors, especially when they're young, have private dreams. That's the best part of them. Sometimes, though, those get over-professionalized and strangulated. Am I boring you? No. I don't quite understand, but you're not boring me. <laughs> what I mean is this. All good doctors must, primarily, be enthusiasts. They must, like writers and painters and priests, they must have a sense of vocation. A deep-rooted, unsentimental desire to do good. Yes, I see that. Well, obviously, one way of preventing disease is worth 50 ways of curing it. That's where my ideal comes in. Preventive medicine isn't anything to do with medicine at all, really. It's concerned with conditions, living conditions and hygiene and common sense. For instance, my specialty is pneumoconiosis. Oh, dear. Don't be alarmed. It's simpler than it sounds. It's nothing but a slow process of fibrosis of the lung due to the inhalation of particles of dust. In the hospital here, there are splendid opportunities for observing cures and making notes because of the coal mines. You suddenly look much younger. Do I? Almost like a little boy. What made you say that? I don't know. Yes, I do. Tell me. No, I couldn't really. You were saying about the coal mines. Oh, yes. The inhalation of coal dust. That's one specific form of the diseases. It's called anthracosis. What are the others? So it's not so much like what he's talking about, but I think, in my theory anyway, is that she's never seen someone this like passionate about something. No, no. Her husband doesn't seem like the kind of guy that gets that excited about anything, let alone right. his job. Yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't even think we ever know what his job is. No, it doesn't matter. He just wears a suit and goes to work. I'm sure he <laughs> carries a briefcase. Yeah, he's a real, uh, he's a real, uh, yeah, I forgot his name. The guy, the guy from Room at the Top. Yeah, Joe Lampton. There we go, thank you. Yeah. He's a real Joe Lampton. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, and yeah, I just think that's really inter a really cool way to kind of show, and you see it all in her face. Um, yeah. You see the the moment all in her face is when, when, when she's like falling for him. And apparently Trevor Howard, that was the hardest scene he had because he's reading, he's basically reading off a list of diseases <laughs> related to, you know, coal dust. Yeah. And he just, he had a hard time with the subtext of it. 
like that 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 you know it's it's a mo- the moment where they kind of fall for each other and apparently because of his hard time that he had she had a really hard time reacting to it so that scene took a long time to shoot well they got it because it seemed to come off fun. like that's the thing i had no issues with their chemistry in this movie no it like they they work very well and play very well off each other and i believed it yeah their chemistry is great and again i think it's so it, it's interesting too because they're both not and this is no slight on either of them but they're both they're not models no. neither of them they're well, they're normal looking folks yes absolutely as was the style at the time you know back in those days you know they, they would I make mean, up but they had more normal looking people than say we do today I mean, yeah, but I mean, they're, they're, this is not like a, you know, like a Brit Eklund, <laughs> like, you know. And, and British people have always uh, uh, been way more accepting of the of the the less uh, attractive amongst us. Now, I wouldn't know anything about that, but uh, <laughs> oh, you're 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 a, a real Derek Zoolander. You are. Oh, I'm an Adonis, Brennan. You don't even you don't even understand the full extent of it. Oh, oh, I'm telling you, man, when this when this isolation is over, you're gonna find out. I'm going to jump them bones. Ow, ow, yeah. So, but yeah, no, I just, I think that's a really, uh, it's a really well done scene of when they, uh, when they fall in love. Can we talk about like, I know this is a smaller scale movie, um, but David Lean is obviously known for his, like, the, the people he hires to do is like his cinematography. Yeah. And I think this movie is really no exception, despite the fact that it's a smaller scale. Yeah, it 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 shows how good he. I mean, we've seen other movies of his, but like Great Expectations, clearly. But like he works so good in black and white, and and uh, the guys he picks to be his cinematographer. Because let's make no mistake, they were guys. <laughs> um, well, yeah, his cinematographer's name is Robert Krasker. Yes. Who only worked on this Lean film? As again, most people who collab- collaborated with David Lean only worked on one or two movies. Yes. He got what he wanted, can... and that's all – yeah, exactly. That's all they can handle. <laughs> that's all they can handle from him. Um, but there's even like – I mean even we listened to that earlier scene where Dolly is talking. He even does like a close-up on her mouth, yes. <laughs> which is almost like – it's almost like in a in a movie where you see a close-up on the gun. It's like that's her weapon. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and it, it was such a wonderful thing because it you know it's very early in cinema's history, but that really drives home the kind of like – almost insanity of, of her speaking and, and how it's affecting Laura. And then I'm reminded of that at the end of the movie too, when we have that scene where Laura is sitting after he kind of leaves and the camera starts to twist uh, and spin and she goes into, she's basically sitting on screen at a 45 degree angle and it's just driving home kind of the, the mental breakdown she's having or the, or the coming to terms with the fact that this is over, you know, you got to respect that. It's, it's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, and 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 I love like as the movie goes on too, you kind of see the shots get a little bit tighter. Mm-hmm. Um, that you see that like the shadows get like higher, uh, and the music changes. Like it gets a lot less like upbeat. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like the way they use they utilize. I mean, this isn't so much a cinematography thing as it is a sound design thing, but the way they use like the sounds of the train brakes and the whistles, like at the yes. opportune moments. Yeah, it seems often when they have a kiss, there's, it's, it's accompanied by a train blasting by and a whistle. At different opportune times in the movie, a train will come by and, and make a noise and to punctuate something. Yeah, and and I, what I like too is when we get their final – what's interesting is like there's a lot of dialogue obviously when they're first meeting, when they have their first kind of quote-unquote date. Mm. Um, but when they have their final like outing – Right before, you know, it, they, they kind of decide, like, this is the end. This is our last day. Um, you don't hear any dialogue. Mm. It's all just a montage of them going to the same places they went to earlier. Yeah, There's no dialogue. Narrates. Yeah, she narrates. And everything just seems a lot colder. Yeah. Like, it just seems like they, they barely even look at each other. They actually go under, um, when they go under the train station, or when they go to the train station earlier, they had this wild, like, they had this, like, passionate embrace. Yes. And when they go to it in the end scene, they ju- they don't even look at each other. They just walk no. together kind of side by side. Yeah. Also, we should probably point out, I know it's late in the podcast, we should probably point out that the, the narrative conceit of this movie is she is sitting, well, after the initial scene happens yeah. and she goes home, she's sitting in the living room with her husband and they're getting ready to just go to bed. He's doing the crossword puzzle. And she sits there staring off into the distance and basically in her head begins telling him as if he were listening the story of the whole yeah. thing. And, and that's the, and, what we hear is her monologue recounting the story theoretically to her husband. Yeah, it's like her. It's kind of her like practicing what she would say if she was confessing everything to him. Yeah, 
Yeah. And and the the sad thing is that the real tragedy here is that she says he's literally the only one she could tell who'd be mature enough to hear it. Yeah. And obviously the last person she can tell. Yeah. And at the same time, she also says like, I couldn't even like, she could, she says she couldn't even bring herself to tell him later in life because she feels like he'll just look back and, and be hurt over all the years they spent together thinking that there was like a false attachment or something. Yeah. And it, and it comes down to that, that, ancient debate of the cheater uh you know the the question of do you tell the person because you think they deserve to know the truth and that it will give you yourself some relief or do you for their sake maintain the fiction and deal with the emotional consequences thereof yeah and and the movie doesn't let her off the hook but it also doesn't completely paint her as a as a you know as a villain no she's not a villain she's incredibly sympathetic uh but like what i what i really like about everything is that at the end of this there's no there's no fix there's no like easy solution to what she's going through life just goes on man she just has to keep on living and go back to her life and try to make the best of it well and that's the thing he he says i don't her husband says kind of i don't know where you've been but i'm glad to have you back yeah and it's like is this just like a metaphor of like you know he knows she's been kind of feeling weird but he's glad that she's okay or does he kind of figure out something well that's the question right is is he that kind of guy that he just he figures she's been through something like that and is willing to just be like i'm glad to have you back or was she just like mentally in a different place and now she's in a mental place that he feels is more uh uh, traditional or, or more like that he recognizes and so he's like yeah i'm glad to have you back yeah i think based on his character and Mm -hmm. and how non-attentive he is i don't think he catches on no no i think yeah but uh, yeah but also like you say he is a mature guy and i feel like he wouldn't he he's not going to beat the shit out of her or or anything like that if he tells her he'll but it's still it's it would change things for sure yeah yeah it's it's just a really interesting like layered like it, there's so many easy routes this movie can take and it refuses to take any of them yes absolutely um she uh and, and and her emotional outburst at the end, it's also like an interpretive moment. Like, is that her happy that she's, you know, everything is okay and everything's kind of accepted? Or is that just kind of her, or is that a mix of her like emotional, like, is it sadness? I think, yeah, I, I think it's everything. I think it's all those things. It's, it's the fact that she's now going to have to go back to life as she previously knew it and whether that's good or whether that's bad that's all being expelled in that emotional moment deep dog man (laughs) i mean it was david lean and it was number two so i wasn't expecting this to be bad no certainly not but man it it is so compelling and so like well made well paced and and would i think hold up against anything produced today easily Oh, yeah. And I I think I even texted you this after I watched the movie. I said they could make this movie today and not really change that much. Like Mm. the technological stuff, obviously, but like a lot of the. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's just it just feels like very it just it feels very modern in that way. Yeah. I do want to uh, I do want to play one more clip and I'll obviously we'll we'll see it. If you have anything else you want to add to this as well, obviously, but I do want to play just a couple little things to point out. But yes. Okay. I do want to play one more clip, though. And this is when they um, they decide to end it. They basically basically decide, like, this is the end of our being together. I love you, Laura. I shall love you always until the end of my life. I can't look at you now because I know something. I know that this is the beginning of the end. Not the end of my loving you, but the end of our being together. But not quite yet, darling. Please, not quite yet. Very well, not quite yet. I know what you feel about this evening. I mean about the sordidness of it. I know about the strain of our different lives. Our lives apart from each other. The feeling of guilt, of doing wrong, is too strong, isn't it? Too great a price to pay for the happiness we have together. I know all this because it's the same for me too. You can look at me now, I'm all right. Let's be very careful. Let's prepare ourselves. 
A sudden break now, however brave and admirable, would be too cruel. We can't do such violence to our hearts and minds. Very well. And, and, and yeah, he they, they approach it very strategically. They're like, if we ended this just suddenly without any sort of without any sort of conclusion, without any sort of like final meeting, it, it would destroy us. And then they don't kind of have their final moment. But it's like, is it better that they didn't? Yeah. You know, it, it's it's a it's a debate there because their final moment is him getting up while Dolly is blabbering and he just kind of puts his hand on her shoulder and he walks out. And ultimately, I, I think that's a much more effective ending than if they'd like had a full on like moment on the on the platform, you know, with a full on kiss and, and then staring at each other as he gets on the train and she watches him go away. And then she starts running after the train and then the train goes off and she stops at the end of the platform and just looks dejected. No, we don't need that. Yeah, that's a totally different movie. And we might talk about a movie like that on this list. I feel yes. like something like that is going to come up. I feel sure. like it I feel like it has come up. <laughs> we probably have watched a movie like that. But yeah, yeah. But that's not what this movie is. That's this movie that that is decidedly un-British. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um this this goes along with one of my favorite lines in Pink Floyd is from uh, a time where the the line goes uh uh what is it um Oh, I wish you were here. Wrong, wrong album. And just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl. Yeah, right. This is my uh, impression of oh, Bob Dylan doing it. Pink Floyd, by the way. <laughs> and I know the same old zoo. What have you found? Same old fears. Wish you were well, here. Well, wish you were here. All right, the line. So let me start again here. It reminds me... It, it, because they're British, right? And and British people can't be happy. And I always go back to that line in, in Time by Pink Floyd where they go, uh, where the line is, hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what this movie is in a nutshell? These two people hanging on in quiet desperation, yeah. uh, trying to, they want this thing, but they can't have it. And, and they struggle with it. But yeah, it's all just quiet, quiet desperation. And I think what's really interesting, you mentioned the Pink Floyd thing, and, you know, we talked about Eric Carmen, and every time I hear that, by the way, I can't help but think of South Park. But we talked about Eric Carmen. Uh, we talked about, and I remember when we talked about Taste of Honey, we talked about the influence that had on music. What is with these British movies that have such a heavy influence on pop music? I, well, that's it. I mean, you have to think that these, well, these British, because British. Uh, influence in pop music was so grand in the 50s and 60s you had these kids in their 20s that grew up watching these movies going to the yeah. theater and watching these things and maybe seeing them on tv if their families were wealthy enough to have a tv uh listen, this was the pop culture of the era listen jason i don't even own a tv but fingertips have memories and mine can't forget the curves of your body sure is that a song that is by mr harvey danger Oh, 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 yes. Uh, 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 he he's not sick, but he's not well. <laughs> right, but I'm in hell, etc. Yeah. yeah. Um. What what else What else do you got to add, Jason? Uh. Well, here's Jason's bits and bobs uh, as I go yep. through my notes. Oh, here. I like the name of that segment. Well, it's it's basically what I do, and now I have a name for it. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, Do Dolly Shop till she almost dropped. I didn't realize that phrase was that old. And uh, my mother's the sort of person that would have many things, I think, in her possession that have that phrase on it. Um, okay. Love you, mom. Uh, that look of despair, uh, the prospect of a train ride with mom. That was what I, because I really thought she was her mother. Um, when they were hanging out together, uh, 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 well, hanging out together, they lived together. But uh, Laura and her husband, they had this weird looking fucking beaker on the table that I think was for coffee, but I wasn't sure. I'd never seen anything like that before, and I wasn't sure what it was for. It looked like it looked like a beaker out of a lab, hmm. and it looked like it had like a candle under it. Uh, British people, if that's a thing, and you know what it is, please tell me. Uh, let's see. Tweet here. us, please. Please, uh, Stanley Holloway. He's the he's the best. Love that guy. Yeah, we we I mean we don't we didn't give enough notice to stanley holloway because the stanley holloway's whole subplot with um and i'll get her name because we're gonna do her fucking justice here jason yeah. stanley holloway's uh whole chemistry and scenes with joyce carey is so interesting it's such an interesting yeah. addition to this movie because it provide because they're having a little affair too yes and it's almost like the flip side of what's happening in our main story yeah it's, it's a counterpoint to what's going on with them too there's there's as much seems to be much more fun 
Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a lot lighter, and you don't feel like either of them are tied down to anyone else. No, and Stanley gets to commit some uh, some very casual sexual harassment on her by slapping <laughs> her ass. He does. <laughs> I think yeah. They, yeah, I think they have a previous uh, they have a, they have an existing relationship at right. least. Well, that's it, because clearly they've worked together for a long time. And so that they they are the Jim and Pam of that cafe. <laughs> Absolutely. No question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like when they knock over the cakes and then Wait, does that make, does rather that, than what I was going to say, does that make barrel the Dwight? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so when when they when the soldiers come in and they knock over the cakes and she makes them pick up the cakes and put them back on the platter rather than throwing the cakes out, I'm like, yep, different time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be frowned upon extremely now. Yeah, I, I, I like the line, things would be different if we lived in a warm climate. <laughs> would be, I guess, yeah, because Britain, Britain would be a lot different if we lived in a cl- warm climate. Maybe they wouldn't have conquered so much uh, looking for a warm climate. I always thought it, I, I, when they're walking in the thing, uh, they're walking in the train tunnel and they're holding hands. I'm like, really? Is that a good idea? I get it's, you know, 1945 and people don't have cell phone cameras, but so you should probably still shouldn't be walking around town hand in hand with the man you're cheating on your husband with. I mean, even if you are in the train, you never know who can see. And she does point that out, but only after he wants to kiss her. Well, and they do have that near um, near scare moment where they run into uh, friends, including the yes. one that she set up that alibi with. Yes, and and what does she do to her friend? She fucking gaslights her. She tells her, oh, yeah, you've met this guy before. This is why I brought him to dinner with us. You know him, yeah. And she's like, no, I don't think I do. And he even he's like, I don't think we've met before. She's like, no, we had dinner. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of like that, too, because I'm like, oh, yeah, you could almost fool someone like that into just being like, oh, yes, yes, of course we've met. Yeah, yeah, to, sure. To try to, yeah. to sound like they, they, they're like, oh, I must have forgot this person. <laughs> does that mean that Laura thinks she's dumber than she thinks she is and that she'll just go along with it? <laughs> I'm thinking it's a, I'm thinking because I think Laura is slightly upper class. Yes. And it feels to me like if you're like, oh, yes, you met the uh, you met the Harveys. It's like in 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 her head, her friend is like, I haven't met the Harveys. Just pretend you met the Harveys. It's, yes, it's of course, that, the Harveys. It goes back to that crippling politeness that you don't want to you don't want to contradict them and, and make things awkward. So you're like, yeah, sure. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, right, he looks exactly. Similar. He's a white guy. They all look the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not wrong. And then the movie ends, and here we are. Yeah, and I think you know what, Jason. I think we ought to just give them give them a little bit of, a, a little tribute here. Um, I think we ought to play a scene between Godby and Myrtle just Absolutely. to give Stanley give Stanley Holloway some play here. Give him his due in this podcast. Yeah. Let's just listen to their little scene together. I couldn't resist it. I'm troubled you to keep your hands to yourself. Oh, you're blushing. Oh, you look wonderful when you're angry. Just like an avenging angel. I'll give you avenging angel. Coming in here taking liberties. I thought after what you said last Monday, you wouldn't object to a friendly little slap. Have you mind about last Monday? I'm on duty now. Nice thing if Mr. Saunders had happened to be looking through the window. Well, if Mr. Saunders is in the habit of looking through windows, it's about time he saw something worth looking at. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, it's high spirits. Don't be mad at me. High spirits, indeed. Take your tea and be quiet. It's all your fault, really. I don't know to what you're referring. I was thinking of um, tonight. If you don't learn to behave yourself, there won't be a tonight. Or any other night either. Give us a kiss. Oh, do no such thing. The lady might see us. Come on, a quick one across the bar. Albert, stop it. Come on, there's a lot. Let go of me this minute. There's a lot. Albert! Now look at me, Banbury's all over the floor. Just in time, or born in the vestry. You shut your mouth and help Mr. Godby pick up them cakes. Come along now. What are you standing there gaping at? By the way, another train whistle. Yeah, and also, right, that was the scene where the cakes got knocked over, and that other train conductor coming in being like, oh, are you guys going to fuck? I'm glad I'm here. Sure. Um, so, Jason, this movie, I haven't said this in a while, goes yeah. to the Oscars. Woohoo! Um, it does not win anything, but it is nominated for three awards. Do you care to guess what it might have been nominated for? Well, first off, it's just an honor to be nominated. Thank you. Uh, and second off, uh, uh, I did actually look at it, but I don't remember. Oh, okay. So go ahead. Okay. Well, it is nominated for best adapted screenplay, which I think it definitely deserves. Yeah. Um, it, it, the winner that year is the movie, the best years of our lives, which if, if any of you guys haven't seen out, if you, you guys out there haven't seen, it is a great underappreciated war movie. Um, tackles PTSD stuff in 1946. So it's really ahead of its time. Is that a world war two movie or world war one movie or, uh, I think it's world war 
two, but I'm not, I don't remember a hundred percent, but it, it doesn't really dwell on that a whole lot. It's mostly about like their lives when they return from the war. Wow. That's um, nice. Oh, it's really good. Um, it's also nominated for best actress for Celia Johnson. Nice. Uh, the winner that year was Olivia de Havilland for to each his own, by the way, Olivia de Havilland is still alive to this day. Wow. She's got to be what? 106. She's almost a hundred years old or just wow. over a hundred. So this podcast episode might age terribly if she has passed away. And if well, she has my condolences. Uh, and if not, this is dedicated to you, Olivia. We know you love to listen. We know you love our show. Uh, yeah. She's so. one of our most loyal listeners. Absolutely. And the other award it's nominated for is for best director. However, that year it goes to William Wyler for again, the best years of our lives. That movie kind of sweeps that year. Wow. Um, the BAFTAs were not a thing yet, so it could not be nominated for anything at the BAFTAs. That's no excuse. <laughs> it did win the grand prize at Con, though. Ooh. <laughs> the budget for this movie, surprisingly, this seems pretty high. Um, one million dollars American. Wow. Yeah, that is a high budget. For the 45. box office, unsurprisingly, that it because ca- it came out in 1945, not really known. No numbers are really known, but it was um, it was kind of known to be a huge hit at the time. So it made money. It, it definitely made money, if not its money back and then some. Okay. Uh, so it, it was. It, this is this is a movie that is really highly regarded in 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 Britain. Like this is this is a Fairly. giant movie. I mean, it's number two on the list. I think they just recently did a um, timeout poll of the 100 best British films. It's just a slightly different list than this one, just because it is updated a little bit. Um, and it was still number twelve. Yeah. So this is this is a very highly regarded film. And even in like surprisingly, when when I talk about like, you know, when we talk about the British Film Institute top 100 list, a lot of people on like social media have kind of mentioned this movie and how wonderful it is. So I'm just delighted that I finally got to watch it. Is this movie on the AFI list? No, because it is a decidedly British movie. <laughs> ah, well, that's that's no excuse. <laughs> so. Jason, let's get to our final thoughts here. What, what This movie, Brief Encounter. Start to finish, engrossing, fantastic, watchable, like like just so compelling, the performances. Uh, and like I said, this movie is like it, it, it it's kind of like 39 Steps was in that it just feels like it could, you know, it would easily play a modern day uh, and it makes it still eminently watchable. And yeah, everything about it is fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. Yeah, this is a movie. This is a movie where I was like, okay, I think this movie is going to be great. I think it's going to be really good because it's David Lean, and how can it not be? And I, but at the same time, I was like, number two on the list. That's incre- That's incredibly high. But having watched this movie, I'm not saying like whether or not it would be number two because obviously we still have over half of the list to go. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I completely understand why it would be because this this movie this is a really like a perfect movie like i don't really have any any drawbacks to it like there's not really any flaws that i could point out here no nothing nothing specifically you know i mean i I probably could if i really wanted to get nitpicky i could probably take issue with like a certain set or a makeup but why would i do that this movie's (laughs) fine the uh the the pastiche was a little dry yes yes Mm, yeah yeah well, and for a movie about like for a movie as as you know the plot as like simple as it is, it's never boring for a minute. No, it's no. it never loses your attention. It grips you from minute one right to the end. They can and, put that on the DVD case. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to do with a movie in our modern modern age from 1945. Like that's not an easy accomplishment. No, for true. our for our delicate modern eyes and ears. For a movie that's, you know, 75 years old, uh, that it's still this watchable, that's that's really, that's an achievement. Exactly. So, Jason. Brandon, it's time. It is. It's Vader time. It is Vader time. And I can finally say properly that normally we roll the dice at this point. Because we love physical manifestations of random chance, Brandon. We do. We do love all of that stuff that you just said. But we can't today because we are separate, unfortunately, because we are staying safe by staying at home. Hashtag stay home. Hashtag if you can. Um, so we are staying home. We are we are in separate homes. We are we are sitting behind prison. Bar- what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> we are separated. You're setting the scene. You're setting the flavor, Brent. Yeah, we are separated by the pandemic that is sweeping the nation. Um, sounds like a a number one hit 
Yeah, I was going to uh, say, it's, it's, it's Megas- sweeping the nation faster than the Macarena. <laughs> Hey, corona, corona, corona. No, that's terrible. Um, hey, coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, so we are going to virtually kind of roll the dice, but we're not going to, it's not going to give us a number. It's just going to give us a movie. All right. It's going to well, give us that comment, comment picker. Yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to give us a movie on the list. It's just going to give us a movie of any kind. Ooh, I hope it's Star Trek 2. Uh, JK, it's a movie on the list. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So we're, we've got the remaining movies on the list, and we're going to we're gonna hit start, and we're going to get a random movie on the BFI Top 100, and that is the movie that we are going to talk about next week. Jason. All right, Brendan. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Shall we count it? No. I'm going to say something, and then you will press it. Ready? Okay. okay. Brendan! Press that button! A little premature. That's okay. They don't know. The Red Shoes. The Red Shoes. All right, Jason. The Red Shoes. We're we're staying near the top of this list. This is number nine on the list. 19. We're staying around close to the same year. This is 1948. This is actually only our second movie by Powell and Pressburger. Oh, we, neat. We talked about Black Narcissus, and this is the Red Shoes. And I'm going to go off on, go out on a limb here. I think this movie had something, some kind of inspiration on Black Swan. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. But does, I think it, it does seem to be about ballerinas, so I can see it, why you might think that. It is about ballet, yeah, for sure. Um, and if it, if Black Narcissus, um, if we remember Black Narcissus, it has beautiful, it's going to have some beautiful choreography, or cinematography, probably some beautiful choreography <laughs> well, I too. So. I mean, it's, it's a ballet movie. Come on. But yeah, so we're so. going to talk about number nine. We're not going too far down from where we were. Yeah, no, I'm fine with right. that. Yeah, Powell and Presper, here we go. Let's do it. Um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, until then... Uh, you can find us on Twitter at BFI underscore pod. You can find us on Facebook. Just search for For Screen. And country. You can find Jason on Twitter. That's at Jason D. McLeod. That's M-A-C-L-E-O-D. Hit me up. Okay. They're going to they're gonna briefly encounter you. That's right. That's so what Twitter is like, all like about. Like Strangers? See, the, oh, just a quick, quick thing. I thought this movie might have been like something like Strangers on a Train, that the brief encounter was going to be like something much more uh, sinister. Mm-hmm. But uh, thankfully it wasn't. I mean, it is pretty sinister. Adultery is a sin, Jason. I guess so. It's, it's also left-handed. What? Sinister. That's what the sinister actually means. Is like is like of of being left-handed. What? Yeah, no. It's fucked. Yeah. No. Yeah, and and you know what? You, you know how I know that's true? Because Obama was the Antichrist. So on that note, <laughs> let's just leave everybody lingering with that idea. <laughs> Uh, by the way, guys, if you want to see something great, just watch Don Lemon wonder out loud why Donald Trump doesn't like Barack Obama. It's pretty, it's pretty great. Don Lemon is fantastic. Uh, he, he is, is fantastic. He he's the uh, uh uh what's the guy's name from uh network? Howard Beale. <laughs> yeah, he he's Howard Beale in some ways. He's just so frustrated on TV and trying so very hard not to just stand up and scream. <laughs> yeah. But if you haven't seen that, guys, watch it. That clip is gold. Um, I mean, not in a sarcastic way. It's it's good. That being said, Jason, I've just got to say to you, God save the queen. God save the screen. <laughs> and for screen and country, I'm Brendan. I'm Jason. Are you okay? I'm, I'm feeling a little uh, under the weather. Uh, maybe we should meet up in person. Would you like to go to the theater? Uh, yes, and maybe I should lick all your groceries for you. That, Briefly. That? Brief. Briefly. Quickly. Quickly now. Encounter me. Me and Mrs. Jones We got a thing going on Both know that it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let it go now.
We meet every day at the same cafe. Six thirty, and no one knows she'll be there. Holding hands, making all kinds of plans, while the jukebox plays our favorite song. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones. Mm. We got a thing. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, "It is health that is real wealth, and not pieces of gold and silver." Listen to the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth.